Well, greetings, fellow Bereans. My name is Frank Spear. Let me welcome you to this course entitled The Significance of Metaphor in the Bible, Figurative versus Literal Language. I am a native New Jerseyan, a former pastor of 15 years, a Bible student for over 25 years. Now, in this course, we're going to examine what I consider to be one of the supreme principles of biblical interpretation, of biblical hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation, and that is Hebrew metaphor, idiom, uh, figurative language, symbolic language, figures of speech. Now, this poetic manner of Hebrew expression is without question crucial for you and I to understand uh, as students of the Bible. We need to understand how this language is used throughout the Scripture. And the Word of God is absolutely jam-packed with this metaphoric expression, absolutely stuffed to the rafters <laughs> in a figurative manner of speaking with exaggerated pictorial terminology. Understanding or not understanding the role of figurative language in the Bible will be a determining factor in how we understand a whole lot of the Bible. And in turn, that will shape our worldview, which in turn shapes our behavior in this world in which we live. Now, uh, let's, let's get a working definition of metaphor, okay? Uh, generally speaking, metaphor is an expression that is without literal meaning, okay? So, for example, it's raining cats and dogs. Okay, not literally it isn't. At least I hope not, <laughs> since that would be uh, extremely dangerous and messy and a whole lot of other things we won't get into. But this is also known as simile, uh, a figure of speech that draws an exaggerated comparison between two different things in order to make a point. Two things that differ are compared because they have something uh, in common. So uh, you see this quite often in the book of Proverbs, for example, or Jesus would say, uh, use parables. And parables are very often simile. Uh, one thing is like another. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move on through this course. Now, the Bible very often uses figures of speech in a specific way. Um, the imagery is used of a material thing to represent a spiritual thing, something physical to represent something non-physical, okay? So metaphor in its broadest sense uh, in the Bible is used as uh, an antithesis, right? Um, hyperbole and simile would also be considered types of metaphor, a hyperbole is an exaggeration for emphasis, right? When you say it's raining cats and dogs, you are exaggerating in order to make a point. And the Bible does this quite often, okay? Uh, it uses what we might call end-of-the-world language, especially in the Old Testament prophets. We might also call this collapsing universe language. The universe is falling apart, right? The earth is splitting in two and the, the heavens are being rolled up like a scroll and the stars are falling out of the sky and the sun is going dark and the moon is turning into blood and you've got all this cosmological language, this language concerning the planets, planetary language, okay? And earth being one of those planets. Uh, most often we'll find that these figures of speech are used in association with the various days of the Lord, okay? The day of the Lord is approaching. The day of the Lord is coming. Behold, the day of the Lord. We see this all throughout the Old Testament, okay? So these days of the Lord, there are multiple days of the Lord, and they are divine visitations of God in judgment upon a people or upon a nation, usually bringing one nation against another to destroy it. These are usually, uh, this is usually what's going on when we're talking about the day of the Lord is coming for you, Babylon. The day of the Lord is coming for you, Egypt. 
the day of the Lord is coming for you, Israel. Divine visitation in judgment. Okay? So symbolism, allegory, simile, all expressions that draw an exaggerated comparison between two different things in order to drive home a point. Otherwise, as my mother would say to me growing up, trying to make a point to you, Frank, is like talking to a wall. See, there is a good example of simile or metaphor. My mother didn't mean it was literally like talking to a wall. Who talks to a wall? But the point is, uh, talking to me sometimes could be like talking to a wall. If you were to talk to a wall, you would get very little response. As a matter of fact, you'd get no response <laughs> and you would get no understanding from that wall. And so this is obvious use of figures of speech or idioms is another word that we can use. Now, all throughout the Bible, we'll come across this very pictorial language in which, as I said, the sun and the moon and the stars are being extinguished, falling from the sky or turning into blood, or the earth is being cracked in half, or the oceans are erupting like uh, watery volcanoes, the skies being ripped in half and rolled up like a scroll. In this first lesson, I just want us to be aware of this kind of language, okay? And we'll get a sample of it shortly from the scriptures. We'll look at some passages together, but in the three sessions that follow this one, we will actually begin to examine some very significant passages of scripture in detail, and I believe that this will um, clear away the cobwebs, uh, so to speak, to use another metaphor or simile, to help us get to the bottom of things uh, in a manner of speaking. So as I'm sure you're aware, and I'm demonstrating here to you, every culture has its own figures of speech, and the Hebrew people in the Hebrew prophets especially had theirs. They were no different than we are. We make use of these similes on a regular basis. And you and I make use of these idioms nearly every day of our lives. Uh, and we most likely do so without even realizing it, simply because they've become ingrained into our everyday communication. Here are a few examples. Um, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Man, that guy had some chip on his shoulder. Well, he didn't have a literal chip on his shoulder. We know that. Uh, these houses are like a dime a dozen. Uh, the down payment on that house was just a drop in the bucket. Uh, hey, man, I could really go for another cup of joe. It'd be kind of tough getting joe to fit into my coffee cup, okay, literally speaking. Um, hey, I went out on a limb for you. Well, I never literally climbed a tree and went out on a limb for anyone. Uh, never bite the hand that feeds you. I've never bitten anyone's hand, at least not as far as I can recall, literally speaking. Uh, and to use more, the more modern vernacular, uh, uh, a teenager or a young person might say, man, this new song is off the chain, you know, or that's how I roll or that's how I bounce, you know, uh, well, I've never seen anyone bounce away from me or literally get on the ground and roll away from me when they had to leave. And I've never, uh, when they say this new song is off the chain, I've never seen a chain once. Uh, you know, any metal links in front of me uh, when we're talking about the chain. So you get the point. These are all very common and very dramatic overstatements, if you will. Word pictures that are intended to conjure up exaggerated images in our minds in order to drive home a point, okay? I just said, I just used another one there, drive home a point. That's an idiom. Um, now, if you attempted to interpret that literally, hyper-literally, with a wooden literalism, just let's take the words that Frank just used and, and take them each literally, um, then you might get the impression that I'm going to drive home a carload of sharpened pencils in my car. You know, when I'm dry, when I said I'm driving home a point. So what is Frank getting in his car and putting sharp pencils in the back seat and driving them home? And where is home? Is it their home or is it Frank's home? And, uh, you know, it becomes ridiculous at that point. Literalism there would lead to absurdity. Now, the Bible uses idioms as well. 
Um, let's take a look at a few of those. Uh, here's one. The mouth of an adulteress is an open grave. So we've got that from Proverbs. Well, her mouth is not literally an open grave. You wouldn't put anything dead inside of her mouth. You know what I'm saying. Uh, here's another one. I've made a contract with my eyes. God is riding on a cloud or on the clouds. Smoke went out from God's nostrils and fire came out of his mouth. Jesus said, I am the door. The sun and the moon and the stars bowed down to me. The locusts were like wild horses prepared for battle. The locusts were like simile, comparison. The locusts were like horses prepared for battle. Here's another one. Thus says the Lord, I will draw my sword from its sheath. Now we know that the Lord does not have a sword and the Lord does not have a sheath buckled around his waist. Okay, this is not literal language, obviously. Um, how about this one? God rode on an angel and flew, and he appeared on the wings of the wind. The stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Paul said, to come into a New Testament one, Paul said, I am being poured out like a drink offering. So there we see the word like again. Paul is not literally, of course, being poured out upon the altar. Paul is not liquid. <laughs> so can you see the trouble we would very quickly find ourselves in if we were to attempt to interpret these words um, with a strict literalism? Now, what if people 2,000 years from now who didn't understand our current figures of speech attempted to interpret our figures of speech literally. Of course, they would end up being way off base in their interpretations, right? Now, see, I just used another metaphor when I said they would be way off base. This is a baseball metaphor or a home base kind of metaphor. You'd be far away from home or far away from the point. You'd be way off base. So they wouldn't understand what that meant. They'd have to do a lot of homework, a lot of research in order to determine what I mean by that saying. So as you can see, and I'm being redundant for a reason here, I want to drive this point home so that you'll never, ever, ever forget it. If we're not careful, very careful in our approach to the use of metaphor in the Bible, then we'll find ourselves doing ridiculous things like putting metal, metal hinges on a wooden Jesus since he said he was the door. Or we'll be giving planets uh, spinal cords and kneecaps because the Bible says that the sun, moon, and stars bowed down to me in a dream. Uh, we'd be putting leather saddles or something on the backs of angels so that God could... Uh, literally ride down on them from heaven to earth. Now, the more we saturate ourselves with the Bible, the more and more obvious the use of metaphor becomes to us. And once we realize what is not to be taken literally, then we have to seek out an alternative meaning, an idiomatic meaning. And so how do we do that? By finding out how those words or phrases are used throughout the entire Bible. Now, this is huge, okay? This is another primary principle of hermeneutics, the science of biblical interpretation. We must allow the Scripture to interpret the Scripture. Let me say that again. We must allow the Scripture to interpret the Scripture. How are these words and phrases used throughout the whole of the Bible? There's also what I'd like to call the law of first mention. When you see a word or a phrase, go back and find out where the first time this word or phrase is used in the Bible. And generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, this will be the working definition of that word or phrase throughout the rest of the Bible. So that's a rule of thumb. Okay, for you to use. But we have to discover, once we realize that certain phrases or words are not to be taken literally, we have to ask ourselves, how did the human author, the writer, and the Holy Spirit, who inspired that author to write those specific words, 
how did they intend for the original readers, the original readers, to understand those words? And there again is another principle of hermeneutics, right? Audience relevance. How did the authors intend the original hearers to understand what they were writing? Okay, that's the question. And it begins at that point. We have to start there. That's the starting point. Not what does this mean to me? How do I interpret this? How would I uh, filter this through my 21st century understanding? But what did the original hearers understand this to mean? Okay, and then and only then can I interpret the meaning of the words. Okay, after all, I mean, it was written to them, right? Not to me directly. When we're reading the Bible, we're reading someone else's mail, so to speak. Okay, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he wasn't writing to Frank Spear, nor was he writing directly to you. Okay, Uh, when Moses was writing Deuteronomy, He had no idea you and I would ever exist all these thousands of years later. He was writing to a specific people living at a specific time, and that was coming through a specific cultural grid through which they would have interpreted his words. Okay? So in order to get inside the head uh, of those original here, there was another one, a figure of speech. In order to get inside the head, Uh, not literally, I hope, uh, of those original hearers, we've got to do some serious homework. And in order for the meaning to become more and more obvious, the meanings of those words, we must become extraordinarily familiar with our Bibles. I'm going to say that again. We must become extraordinarily familiar with our Bibles Not only the actual words themselves, but how those words and expressions are used throughout the Bible. Now, let me offer a friendly warning. If you and I do not have a very good grasp of biblical forms of expression, especially as used by the Old Testament prophets you and I will be in very real danger of misinterpreting and therefore misunderstanding the Bible. And we may be guilty then of mishandling the sacred scriptures, which were entrusted to us by God himself for a lack of study. And that's no minor thing. That's no small thing. You and I, as teachers of the Bible, have a responsibility to work very hard at understanding these things to the best of our ability so as not to mislead either ourselves or others who are trusting us to be their guides in understanding the scriptures. We are not infallible when it comes to our understanding of the scripture. We are mere men, mere humans, and therefore, uh, capable at every turn of misunderstanding. But as long as we have done our best to research, investigate, and examine, we've done the hard work, then uh, I feel that we can be safe in expressing our interpretations and our opinions on what A, B, or C may mean in the Bible. Now, I think we need to always be careful to do this in a spirit of uh, charity, recognizing that we ourselves are vulnerable to misinterpretation and never to be dogmatic, especially on the peripheral truths, the secondary truths of Christianity, okay? Um, I like to offer, when it comes to those types of things, I like to offer up truth for people's consideration, You know, here's my interpretation. Here's the best I can do at this point, and I'll continue to study. But what do you think? Consider what I'm saying and see if it pans out and jives, dovetails with the scriptures. And then you be the judge. You take what I'm saying and you evaluate and you decide. And so I think this is a good way to approach that when we're teaching things that are debatable within Christianity. Okay? Now, 
in order for you and I to get a proper handle on biblical language, I'm going to recommend something very practical to you, okay? And I want you to write this down. I am asking you to read through the entire Old Testament in the shortest amount of time possible. Read through the entire Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, right? In the shortest amount of time possible. And then read through from Isaiah to Malachi three more times. So you're going to read through the whole Old Testament and then from Isaiah to Malachi three more times. Again, in the shortest amount of time possible, in the biggest chunks you can handle at one sitting. Now, I promise you, after this, you will be much, much, much better equipped to begin interpreting the New Testament because there is so much of the old wrapped up in the new. Okay, and that is a a really a gold, it comes back to this golden rule of Bible study because the Bible interprets itself. The Bible must be interpreted first and foremost by the Bible, not by the opinions and judgments of men. Okay, though as important as teachers are and God has given them as gifts to the church, whether they're behind a pulpit or a lectern or they're writing with, you know, ink on paper. Those are all beneficial. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. He says, no, all things are yours, Paul says. Embrace all the teachers and all of their perspectives. But ultimately, it is the Bible that is our final authority in all of these things. And therefore, it is our responsibility to be intimately familiar with the Holy Scriptures. Okay? So, The Bible interprets the Bible, and that should be stamped somewhere where you can see that all the time when you're studying, okay? Now, the more familiar you are with the Bible overall, the more naturally you will begin to recognize that what is being said in one book or one place is actually being directly quoted or alluded to uh, from another place. So you'll begin to pick up on the fact um, that this is a quote or this is an illusion, an illusion, or there is a particular theme here or a a literary pattern that one writer is using and I'm noticing that he's drawing upon another writer here, okay? So you'll begin to see those things. You'll begin to hear what I call echoes from one Bible book to another. And you'll begin to develop the ability to make those connections, to connect the dots, so to speak. Oh, off the top of my head, for example, when you come to the passage concerning Jesus' baptism, and you realize, you, you read the passage that says, and the Spirit of God landed upon him in the form of a dove, right away you should be thinking about Genesis and the flood account and that dove. The ark was a place of safety a place of deliverance from the wrath and judgment of God during that flood. And so is Jesus, our ark of safety. And what does the dove landing on the ark have to do with the dove landing on Jesus? So there's an echo. You see what I'm saying? There's a connection. There are dots to be connected here. And if you didn't know Genesis really well, you wouldn't be able, uh, Genesis and Matthew, let's say, you wouldn't be able to make those connections. And they're all over the place in the Bible, okay? For example, here's another example. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it mentions the period of 10 days. Now, the phrase 10 days is mentioned at least nine other times in the Bible. And the more you read and study, the more you'll be aware of those quotations, of those uses, usages, And the more you will understand those phrases and how they're used in their particular contexts, and the more you'll be able to make connections. And the greater your skill at Bible interpretation will become. Now, if you're called to be a teacher, uh, this is your area of expertise. If you're called to be a Bible teacher, let other people work on growing the church or expanding the nursery 
or picking out the paint color in the youth group center or whatever it is, your calling as a teacher, your calling from God Almighty is to understand the Bible in its entirety to the best of your ability and to devote yourself to that task, not only for your, the sake of your own understanding, but for the sake of those sitting under your teaching. Now, at the end of the day, the Bible is literature. And as such, it makes use of many literary devices and literary styles, okay? A metaphor and symbolism is one, but of course it also uses prose, that is a non-poetic language, ordinary speech about ordinary things, plain language with plain meaning. You know, Frank went to the store to get some milk. That's prose. Okay. It's snowing outside. I'm going to go skiing later. That's prose. Okay. <laughs> um, let me give you an example from scripture. Uh, let's take Exodus chapter two verses 16 and 17. It says this, now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. Okay, nothing mystical here, nothing figurative and symbolic about anything stated. The priest in this text is an actual priest with seven literal daughters. <laughs> the water mentioned here is literal H2O. Uh, okay, the, the, the troughs uh, used to water the flocks are literal wooden troughs. Moses literally watered a thirsty flock of sheep. This is what's going on here. There's no cryptic language, no secret meanings. Moses watering the sheep is not code language, you know, for Moses teaching God's commands to the children of Israel or something like that, for example. And we have no authorization to force it to mean anything other than what it's simply saying. Simple, ordinary historical narrative. Okay, now, having said that, we might legitimately make use of a passage like this, okay, using the rhetorical device of simile. Uh, and we could turn it into a parable. We could use this verse and this historical uh, scene, okay, to make a comparison and say something like this. Um, uh, now, just like you know, uh, in a similar fashion as Moses literally watered those thirsty sheep, so ought we Bible teachers or parents bring the refreshing, life-giving water of God's word to our congregations or to the children in our home, because in many ways, people are like thirsty sheep. So you see, we could draw that comparison. Now, this is obviously not what Exodus chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, is literally speaking about. Nevertheless, we're justified in making a sort of parable out of that narrative. Uh, we're, we're justified in deriving a spiritual truth out from a scene from ordinary life, the ordinary life of a shepherd, because Jesus himself did this all the time in his parables. And as long as we're not saying this literally means that, then then we're safe. We're drawing an analogy, so to speak, okay? Uh, but this is very different from pure metaphor or figurative language as is used in the Bible. Now, let's get an example of that. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. Quote, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. Now here we have the obvious use of figurative language. God himself is referred to as a rock, a fortress, a shield, a horn. Now, I don't know anyone who's prepared to say that God himself is literally any or all of these material objects. That would be just pure absurdity. And we, we all know that. God is certainly not a 
composite of hardened minerals, right? God is not a rock. Uh, God is not a military building, right? Designed for defense and warfare. He's not literally a fortress. So we understand this. However, God is very much like those things. And that is quite obviously the point of the writer. That's his intention when he's employing, using these associations, these comparisons, okay? So we're back to simile again, okay? Where we get the word similarities or similar, right? So we have this comparison between two otherwise dissimilar things, right? So we know God is a spirit being, not a material being. And so he's obviously not a wooden or a metal shield, but he is very similar to a shield in one way or another way, right? God is like a shield in that he protects his people from their enemies. He is like a fortress in that his children can take shelter in him, take refuge in him when things get tough, when the storm hits. So we have these usages of word pictures to paint into our minds the character of God. Remember, most of these people living in Bible times were illiterate. They could neither read nor write. And so the biblical authors paint with these word pictures in order to indelibly ingrain in the minds of the listener pictures of the character of God, of the nature of God, of prophecies to come and so forth and so on. Now, in our next session, since we've laid a good foundation here in this first session, things will get really juicy as we begin to explore apocalyptic language, the use of metaphor in the Bible as it pertains to the last days, uh, the day of the Lord, uh, the, the end of the world terminology that has so many people mixed up in so many ways uh, in the days in which we live. This concludes session number one. Please refer to your student session instructions on this webpage or see your student handbook for complete details.